Good afternoon, brethren. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Hope everyone's had a great week. It's hard to believe that we're already into August. The summer is going by, and it seems like it's hot all over the country right now. Well, as always, I'd like to start out by saying hello and a special Sabbath greeting to some special ladies, to Nancy Miller, to Daisy Swint, to Jean Ward, to Martha Frederick, and also to Alice Jostan. I hope you're having a wonderful Sabbath. Also, a special shout out again to our brethren in Mexico, Bruce and Teresa Metzger and John. And just, I hope everyone is having a wonderful Sabbath. Brethren, chains are a very useful and many times invaluable tool for accomplishing a task. Chains vary widely in size. You can make a chain by simply hooking some paper clips together. Now that chain would be very small and wouldn't be able to pull that very much, pull much, and it's pretty flimsy. We have bigger chains that we put on our tires when it snows. That's something we don't really do around here in Houston, but I've put tires on chains. We have we have even bigger chains that we use to pull cars and trucks. And then we have some of the biggest chains connected to anchors on very, very large warships like battleships and aircraft carriers, where the chains themselves are huge and even weigh several tons. There are numerous and maybe even humorous examples of everyday activities given the opposite condition of its use and function becomes useless or impossible. Activities like skiing up a mountain or floating upstream in a river or falling up the stairs or coasting uphill are all examples of counterintuitive, if not impossible, actions. And brethren, there is another counterintuitive and practically impossible action. And that action is pushing a chain. Have you ever tried to push a chain? <laughs> you really didn't get that far. What happens when you push a chain? The chain just folds in on itself and begins to, to bunch up into a tangled mess of chaos. Then you spend the next several hours trying to untangle the chain links from the huge mess that you've created. However, when you pull a chain, the chain follows link by link in a single line and just follows you wherever you're going. Chains work when they're pulled. Chains do not work and they don't function well when they're pushed. This is true regardless of size and type. It's true if you make a chain of paper clips on your desk and it's true with huge chains attached to the anchor of an aircraft carrier. You know, when, when that chain is released, the weight of the anchor pulls the chain as it descends further and further into the water without getting tangled up and bunched up. Brethren, the same principle applies in our spiritual lives and in our Heavenly Father's relationship and interaction with us and in our re relationship and interaction with Him. In my sermon this afternoon entitled, Being Led by Our Heavenly Father, I would like to explore the subject of being led by our, our Heavenly Father and its application in our spiritual lives. And I'd like to explore this subject in four points. Brethren, the first point in being led by our Heavenly Father is, point number one, our Heavenly Father does not push us. Our Heavenly Father does not push us. Brethren, this is a very important concept and truth. Being pushed has a negative connotation. Being pushed brings up images of a bully pushing a little boy or girl onto the ground or being forced to do something against our will. You know, back in the 1960s and 1970s, illegal drug dealers were known as pushers. I have not found an example where our Heavenly Father pushed His saints to do actions against their will. There are many examples where He's inspired people, led people, encouraged people to take actions. However, brethren, there is a being, there is a being who pushes us 
and bunches us all up into a tangled mess of chaos. This is his specialty, and he's very good at it. And that being is Satan. Satan and his demons push continually at the saints. God our fathers elect and called out ones in this world. Satan hates our Heavenly Father more than anyone or anything. Satan hates all that is connected with God our Father, including Jesus, the holy angels, anything holy, and the saints, including us. Satan is definitely not our friend. He is not our friend. He wants our Heavenly Father's plan to fail. Please turn with me to Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4. Satan tried desperately to get Jesus to sin. Just once. Just once so that Jesus would nullify the entire plan of salvation that Jesus and his Father had implemented. After it tempting Jesus with hunger after Jesus had fasted 40 days, by tempting him to turn stones into bread, and tempting him with arrogance, by tempting him to fall from the top of the temple to make his father save him. Satan tempted Jesus with one final test. We read this in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 8. Matthew chapter 4 in verse 8. Again, the devil takes Jesus up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get you hence, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship Jehovah your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil leaves him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Brethren, Satan pushed at Jesus and tempting him with everything he had. But Jesus, filled without measure with his Father's Spirit, resisted the temptations and defeated Satan's attempts. Satan was not successful in influencing Jesus to turn away from his Father. But Satan has not given up on his attempts to thwart God's plan of salvation. He wants to destroy the saints and undo the plan of salvation by disqualifying each and every one of the saints from entering our Father's kingdom. Please turn with me to 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. Again, Satan wants to destroy us and wants to destroy our chances for salvation. The Apostle Peter warns us to be careful because Satan wants in to destroy us indeed. In 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Peter writes, Be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The Greek word for sober in verse 8 is nepho, N-E-F-O. And it's Strong's number 3525, which not only means to abstain from wine, but also to be circumspect and to be free from illusion and an extension to be free from the intoxicating influences of sin. Satan wants to destroy us, and we need to always be cognizant of that fact. He pushes us. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians 2. The Apostle Paul wants us also to forgive others because harboring resentment and animosity to others is a crack in the defenses that Satan will use and exploit, and he will take advantage of that to the maximum with great damage. We read this in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. For to this end also I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things, 
to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes I forgave it in the person of Christ. And then verse 11, lest Satan should t get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Brethren, do we quickly forgive others of their sins against us, their offenses against us? Do we harbor resentment and bitter, bitterness, and even hatred toward others because of their actions? Satan will push at us with great force to use this resentment and this bitterness to fester and to drive a wedge between us and our Father and between us and other brethren, other brothers and sisters in the faith. Will we allow that? Satan has done an incredible job in hiding our Heavenly Father in plain sight in the pages of the Bible. It's incredible. Our Heavenly Father is everywhere in the Bible, but He's hidden in plain sight. Satan does not want the wonderful truth of the identity of God, our Father, to be disclosed and revealed to the world and to the churches of God. How many times have we had conversations about the identity of God, our Father, in the Bible with brethren and the churches of God? And after showing many irrefutable verses and proofs from the Scripture, the immediate response is a denigrating phrase that we've all heard, what difference does it make? Please turn with me to Mark 4, and we'll read a portion of the well-known parable of the sower and the seed. Mark chapter 4. All very familiar with this set of scriptures. Mark chapter 4, and we'll read verses 3 and 4. Mark chapter 4 and verse 3. Jesus said, Hark, and behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now the disciples didn't know what, was, what this meant. The disciples then asked Jesus to explain the parable. So he did, beginning in verse 14. So in Mark 4 and verse 14. The sower sows the seed, the, sows the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. How many times have we talked to people and, in, and that proof, that wonderful truth of who God the Father is, is taken immediately from their hearts? So Satan comes and snatches that understanding from people immediately upon hearing the truth about God our Father, even in the churches of God. He hates this truth and does not want it proclaimed anywhere. Furthermore, brethren, Satan and his demons hurt people. They push people to hurt themselves. Please turn with me to Luke 9, and we will read about a little boy who was demon-possessed. We read this in Luke chapter 9 and verse 38. Luke chapter 9 and verse 38. Jesus said, And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech you, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit takes him, and he suddenly cries out. And it tears him that he foamed again, and bruising him hardly departs from him. But, and I besought your disciples to cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus answering and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring your son hither. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tore him. He actually tore him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. You know, brethren, Satan continually pushed and pushed and battered the poor boy. The boy was saved from a life of self-mutilation and torment by the healing performed by Jesus. Please turn with me to Acts 10. You know, Peter was preaching in Caesarea after he had had the vision of the sheet of the unclean animals descending from 
the heavens, and after he had met Cornelius, who was wanting to be baptized. In his discourse, Peter preached the following. We read this in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 and verse 37. Acts chapter 10 and verse 37. The word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now in verse 38, the Greek word for oppressed is kada duna steuo. K-A-T-A-D-U-N-A-S-T-E-U-O. And it's Strong's 2616, which means to overpower, to treat harshly, to tyrannize. So Jesus healed those who were being tyrannized and terrorized by Satan and his demons. Just like a bully pushes and terrorizes a little schoolboy or a girl, Satan pushes and terrorizes people who let him. No one is immune from Satan's influence and to Satan's devices. No one. Not even elders and leaders in the church. Please turn with me to 1 Timothy 3, and we will read some of the qualifications for an elder in, in the church. We read this in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 2. Paul writes, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, nor covetousness, nor covetous, one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And then verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Satan will push in any way and use any tool in his arsenal that he has to get the saints to fail. Any of the saints to fail. To get the saints to turn against the Father. To get the saints to sin and to snare others to sin. Satan pushes at everyone. No one is immune. Please turn with me to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Satan pushes at all servants in the church. All servants in the church. The Apostle Paul lists several qualifications for being a servant of our Heavenly Father. 2 Timothy 2, and I'll begin in verse 24. And the servant of Jehovah must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. And in verse 26, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Satan is very powerful and he pushes and he pushes at all of us. In verse 25, we read about those in the church who oppose themselves, who need to recover themselves out of the snare of Satan. Verse 26 also states that Satan takes them captive at his will. He pushes. That is, his will is to push and push and push at us always. Please turn with me to Revelation 2. If God our Father allows it, Satan can even cast us into prison. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Revelation 2 and verse 10. In Revelation 2 
chapter 2 and verse 10, we read, Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be you faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Satan is very powerful, and he wants you and me to fail. And he will push at us again and again. Please turn with me to 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Satan pushed against King David and against Israel and pushed David to do something that Jehovah had, had specifically told David not to do. Again, he pushes at everybody. In 1 Chronicles 21, and in verse 1, we read, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me, that I may know it. Satan can only push us, though, to the limits that our Heavenly Father allows him to do. And God our Father uses Satan's pushing to further the spiritual maturing process in us. Again, Satan pushes us. Our Heavenly Father does not. The second point in being led by our Heavenly Father is point number two, our Heavenly Father draws, leads, and guides us. Our Heavenly Father draws, leads, and guides us. Brethren, conversely to Satan and the demons who push us and push us and push us, our Heavenly Father draws us, He leads us, and He guides us. The Bible is full of verses showing how our God our Father, Jehovah, draws, leads, and guides His people. Please turn with me to John 6, and we will read one of the most well-known verses in all the Bible and the churches of God. We, we can recite this from memory. John 6, 44. It says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. You know, brother, what is interesting is the choice of words that Jesus used. Historically, we basically rephrase Jesus' words to say, no man can come to Jesus except the Father call him. But Jesus didn't say that. The Greek verb for draw in verse 44 is helkuo, E-L-K-U-O, helkuo. It's Strong's number 1670. And it means to draw, to pull, to persuade, to draw in focusing on the attraction power of the drawing. So G Jesus is stating that our Heavenly Father draws us toward Him so that we, in turn, will be attracted to Him. It's the only way that we're able to come to Jesus. And it's the only way that the conversion process begins. Please turn with me to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. We read the words in Psalm 25 and hymn 87, Our God is good and upright. And in Psalm 25, beginning in verse 8, we'll read words from David. Psalm 25 and verse 8. Good and upright is Jehovah. Therefore he will teach sinners in the way. The meek he will guide in judgment. And the meek he will teach his way. All the paths of Jehovah are mercy and truth unto such as keep his commandments and his testimonies. His covenant and his testimonies. Verse 9 in the New International Version states, He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Verse 9 in the New Living Translation states, He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. Please turn me a, a few pages back to Psalm 31. Yehovah, our Heavenly Father, leads and guides us. David 
says this again in Psalm 31. Psalm 31, beginning in verse 1. In you, O Jehovah, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be you my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me. Lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for you are my strength. The Hebrew word for guide in verse 3 is nahal, N-A-H-A-L. It's Strong's number 5095, and it means to lead or to guide to a watering place, bringing to a place of rest, much like a shepherd does with his sheep. Please turn with me to Psalm 48. Psalm chapter 48. Another example of Jehovah's guidance to us is given by David to the sons of Korah. So you have Psalm chapter 48, and we'll begin in verse 1. Psalm chapter 48 and verse 1. A song and psalm for the sons of Korah. Great is Jehovah, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. And we'll skip to verse 14. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. In verse 14, David uses the Hebrew verb nahag, N-A-H-A-G, in Strong's 5090, which is closely associated with the verb nahal that we read in Psalm 31. This verb nahag means to lead on, to guide forward. Please turn with me to Psalm 73, and we'll read uh, yet another Psalm of David concerning guidance and leadership by Jehovah. In Psalm 73, and verse 23. Psalm 73 and verse 23. David wrote, Nevertheless I am continually with you that you behold that you hold in me by my right hand. You shall guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they are far from you. They that are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all them that go a whoring from you. In verse 28, But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord Yehovah, that I may declare all his works. In verse 24, David uses the Hebrew verb nacha, N-A-K-H-A-H. It's Strong's 5148, which also means to lead on, to guide toward a certain direction, just as a leader does. David was happy and confident that Yehovah would guide him, and David wanted very much to draw near to him. P please turn with me to Isaiah 58. You know, in a prophecy about future national repentance of the nation of Israel, Isaiah states that Yehovah, our Heavenly Father, will guide them continually in the future. And we read this in Isaiah chapter 58. We'll begin in verse 9. Isaiah 58 and verse 9. Isaiah wrote, writes, Then shall you call, and Jehovah shall answer. You shall cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the, the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if you draw out your soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall you, your light rise in obscurity, and your darkness be as the noonday. And in verse 11, 
And Yehovah shall guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and make fat your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose water fails not. So brethren, even in the future with repentance and with an attitude of obedience and a willingness to follow our Heavenly Father, He will guide mankind. The Old Testament is full of verses which discuss Yehovah guiding His people. It's enough for three or four sermons to cover all the scriptures. But we get the picture and the understanding from the verses that we've covered so far that our Heavenly Father guides and He leads us. He does not push us. Our Heavenly Father does not push us. Well, brethren, what about the New Testament? Please turn with me to John 16. John chapter 16. On the last night of his physical life, Jesus was instructing his disciples concerning the Holy Spirit, which would be coming soon to them. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma. It's Strong's 4151, and it means spirit or breath or wind. Many English words would start with the letters P-N, where the P is silent such as pneumatic, pneumonia, and pneumonic, are all derived from that Greek word pneuma. The Greek word pneuma is actually neuter in the Greek, not masculine. It's a neuter noun. So in the Greek language, a Greek speaker would automatically refer to pneuma as it, not he. But you know, the Trinitarians, when they translated the Bible into English, they changed the it in Greek to he in English in order to refer to the Holy Spirit as the third being in the Trinity. But it's a neuter noun. <clears throat> we read in John 16, verse 13. John chapter 16, verse 13. Jesus said, Howbeit when it, the Spirit of truth, is come, it will guide you into all truth. For it shall not speak of its, uh, itself, and whatever it shall hear, shall it speak, and it will show you things to come. So Jesus instructed his disciples that the Holy Spirit would guide them into truth. It would guide them, not push them, it would guide them. Please turn with me to Romans 8. The Apostle Paul gave the definition of who the sons of our Heavenly Father are. We read this in Romans 8 and verse 12. Romans chapter 8 and verse 12. In Romans 8 and verse 12, Paul writes, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, and you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of your body, you shall live. And verse 14, For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Using what is really written in the Greek, For as many are as led by the Spirit of the God, or God our Father, they are the sons of God our Father. Again, the people whom our Heavenly Father has chosen to work with in this lifetime are led by His Spirit. They're not pushed. Again, the Father does not push. Please turn with me to Luke 4. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit without measure when He was walking on this earth during his physical life. In Luke 4 and verse 1, we read an account that we, of him going into the wilderness. Luke 4 and verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterwards hungered. 
So Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Holy Spirit to do certain things and to go to certain places. Please turn with me to Exodus 13. Exodus chapter 13. A great example of our Heavenly Father leading His people is when is with the children of Israel when they left Egypt. Exodus 13, and we'll begin in verse 17. Exodus chapter 13, and verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, all, all although there, that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. We'll skip to verse 21. And Jehovah went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So brethren, Jehovah led the Israelites from the front. He didn't push the Israelites from the rear. He led his people and they followed. Please turn with me to Numbers 9. Numbers chapter 9, and we'll, we will read how Jehovah led the Israelites during the 40 years in the, in the wilderness. Numbers chapter 9, and we'll begin in verse 15. Numbers chapter 9, beginning in verse 15. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony, and and at even there was upon the tabernacles, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of Jehovah, the children of Israel journeyed. And at the commandment of Jehovah, they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of Jehovah and journeyed not. In verse 20, And so it was, when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of Jehovah, they abode in their tents, and according to the commandment of Jehovah, they journeyed. And so it was, when the cloud abode from even unto morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night that the cloud was taken up, and they journeyed. Or whether it were two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. And when it was taken up, they journeyed. So, brethren, whenever the pillar of cloud or fire moved, the Israelites packed up their belongings and followed it. And whenever the pillar of cloud or fire stopped, the Israelites stopped and they camped. This was their life for 40 years. Have you ever thought what would have happened if the pillar of cloud or fire moved and the Israelites did not follow it? What would have happened if the Israelites just stayed where they were and they watched the cloud go off into the distance and disappear past the horizon? You know, probably no more manna, no more water. You know, instead of drawing close to Jehovah and continuing to follow him, they would have just put a larger and larger distance between them and Jehovah. Fortunately for ancient Israel, that did not happen. Brethren, our Heavenly Father continually leads, draws, and guides us. 
but we must be willing to follow him always. The third point in being led by our Heavenly Father is, as shepherds, God our Father and Jesus Christ lead us as their sheep. As shepherds, God our Father and Jesus Christ lead us as their sheep. You know, sheep need and desire a shepherd. Sheep are loyal to the shepherd who guards them, who protects them, who takes care of them. Sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd. Other voices that are unfamiliar to them actually frighten them. In his book, Animals of the Bible, John Worcestershire writes that, quote, The shepherds of the East give a name to each member of their flocks, which the sheep soon learn and to which they instantly respond. In the dry season, many shepherds with their flocks meet at regular times around the wells. The flocks mingle at troughs, drinking. But when all are satisfied, the shepherds move on in different directions, calling their sheep, which immediately follow, everyone to its own shepherd, with scarcely the possibility of a mistake. Unquote. John Worcester further writes, quote, It is not uncommon in our country for single lambs to receive names and to be petted when they become models of trustful obedience toward their master, but remain timid toward a stranger. It is a peculiarity of sheep that while they are so easily led by one whom they know, they are dr driven with difficulty. Remember that. They are driven with difficulty. They huddle together as if frightened, and the more they are pressed, the more frightened they seem. But if the leaders start forward, the flock follows. Sheep have, unquote, sheep have the natural disposition to follow their shepherd. Sheep are led from the front. Sheep are not driven from the rear. They're not pushed. Satan on the, uh, cattle, on the other hand, are driven from the rear and from the sides. That is why they call them cattle drives. When driving cattle, the cowboys on horseback will scare the, and startle the cattle into moving by yelling, by whistling, by shouting, by shooting guns off in the air. The cattle will then move away from the noise and from the cowboys because they are scared and startled. The cattle are pushed. The cattle are pushed by the cowboys much the same way that Satan and his demons push us. This is the exact opposite with sheep and their shepherd. Please turn with me to John 10. John chapter 10. You know, just as sheep need and desire a shepherd, we as Christians need and desire a shepherd to lead us, to guide us, to protect us. We read this in John 10 and verse 1. John chapter 10 and verse 1. In John 10, verse 1, we read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. You know, brethren, Jesus Christ is our good shepherd. Let's continue to read in John 10, in verse 11 of John chapter 10. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and doesn't care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep 
and am known of my, and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He is the good shepherd, and he was willing to die for his sheep, for us. Jesus was not a hireling who didn't care for his sheep. Let's continue on in John 10. John 10 and verse 25 Jesus answered them, I, I told you and you believe not. The words that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you don't believe because you are not my she of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So Jesus is our shepherd. He's our good shepherd. But our Heavenly Father is our shepherd also. Please turn with me to a very well-known scripture in Psalm 23. Everyone knows Psalm 23. It's the most quoted psalm of all. Psalm 23 in verse 1. Psalm 23 in verse 1. Yehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Brethren, Yehovah, God our Father, is our shepherd, and He leads us also. Please turn with me to Psalm 80, and we will read about Yehovah, our Heavenly Father, and Him being the shepherd of Israel. In Psalm 80 and verse 1, Psalm 80 and verse 1, we read, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, that you... You that lead Joseph like a flock, you that dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come and save us. We know that Yehovah, God our Father, dwelled between the cherubim and the Holy of Holies. Again, verse 1 shows that our Heavenly Father was the shepherd of Israel, who led them like a flock of sheep. Please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And we will read about the chief shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 1, the apostle Peter wrote, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. In verse 2, Feed the flock of God, of the God, Hotheos, the God, God the Father, the flock of God the Father, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willing, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's, heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Verse 2 explains verse 4. The flock is the flock of the God, Hotheos, who was Yehovah to the Jews and the Christians of the first century. The God is God our Father. Therefore, the chief shepherd is God our Father our Heavenly Father, who along with His Son Jesus, the Anointed One, the Good Shepherd, lead us as their sheep. The fourth point in being led by our Heavenly Father, the final point, point number four is, you determine your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Point number four is, you determine your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Please turn with me to Philippians 2. Philippians chapter 2. No one else but you determines your relationship with God our Father and with Jesus the Anointed One. No one else determines your salvation but you. We read this in Philippians 2 and verse 12. 
Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Paul writes, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The Greek verb for work out in verse 12 is katergazomai, K-A-T-E-R-G-A-Z-O-M-A-I. It's Strong's number 2716. And it means to effect by labor, to achieve, to work out, to bring about, to do that from which something results. So we are to labor and to work out and to bring about our own salvation. Our salvation is a personal and individual work which we work out and bring about with our own personal and individual relationship with God our Father and with Jesus Christ. But brethren, we can't earn our salvation. Salvation itself is a gift from our Heavenly Father. But we must do our part. We have responsibilities. We must respond to our Father's will and do our Father's will. Our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ earnestly desire to, for us to succeed. They want to give us His kingdom. Their whole plan is based on us and on mankind succeeding. Please turn with me to Matthew 26. When Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, His disciples fell asleep while they were waiting for Him. In Matthew 26 and verse 40. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 40. In Matthew 26 and verse 40 we read, And he comes to the disciples and finds them asleep, and said unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So brethren, the spirit is always willing. The father is always willing. He's there always for us, but the flesh is weak. God our father is always there drawing us, leading us, guiding us toward him and toward his son and toward perfection. This is exactly why we determine our relationship with our Heavenly Father. How do we respond? You can push someone against their will. You cannot lead and guide someone against their will. The fact is that for one to lead another, the one being led has to be willing to follow. How willing are we to follow our Heavenly Father? Please turn with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. There's a host of reasons why we don't follow Christ and follow our Heavenly Father. There is always an excuse that we can put in the way. Always. Jesus addressed this in talking with his disciples in Luke 9. And there is a cost associated with following Jesus and following our Heavenly Father. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Luke Chapter 9 and verse 23. And he said to them all, If a man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Skipping to verse 27. And it came to pass that as they went into the way, a certain man came unto him and said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not nowhere to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Well, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go you and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at, at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. 
Again, brethren, if the Father draws us toward him and we fight him and we refuse to go toward him, it's very much like the Israelites if they had refused to pack up their belongings and their tents and move when the pillar of cloud moved away. Please turn with me to James 4. James chapter 4. Are we drawing closer to our Heavenly Father with each passing day? Are we? You know, the Apostle James talks about a reciprocal relationship with our Heavenly Father. James chapter 4 and verse 7. We read this in James chapter 4 and verse 7. We read, Submit yourselves therefore to God, Hotheos, the God, God the Father. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And in verse 8, draw nigh, draw near to the God, Hotheos, the God, God our Father. And he will draw nigh to you. Brethren, are we drawing near to our God most high? How is our relationship with our Heavenly Father? How deep is it? How close is it? How much time do we spend with Him? Do we want to spend time with Him? How much time do we talk with Him? How much time do we meditate on issues with Him? You know, brethren, how is our prayer life? Do we pray? What do we pray about each day? Is the bulk of our prayers basically a list of gimmies? Give me this and give me that and give me this and give me that. Even when the gimmies are for others and for their healing and for their help. Not that praying for others and for their healing and help during their trials is not a good and important aspect of our prayers. It definitely is. It definitely is. But do our prayers go beyond that? Day after day after day after day. Do we talk with our Heavenly Father about His creation and His beauty? About being able to see the beautiful colors that He had created in the physical universe around us? Imagine if we couldn't see colors. About how honored we are to be called in this lifetime. About how wonderful it will be at our resurrection when we will be spirit beings. Do we talk to the Father about that? Do we talk to him about the time that we'll see Jesus for the first time? See the holy angels for the first time? And when we will see our Heavenly Father for the first time in all of his splendor and glory? Do we talk with our Heavenly Father about being with him forever in the future? Learning from him, speaking with him, honoring and worshiping him for an eternity in the future? Do we talk to him about our desires, our hopes, our ambitions, our dreams and our ambitions, and our failures, all aspects of our life? Is our prayer life with the Father the same as it was 10 years ago? Have we grown? That's the question. Have we grown? Brethren, what kind of relationship do we have with our Father? What does a mature relationship with our Heavenly Father look like? Our physical families give us a clue. You know, when a father has a son or a mother has a daughter, in the early years, the relationship is pretty elementary, pretty much one way. However, later in life, when the son or daughter is in their mid to late 20s, the relationship matures where the father and son or mother and daughter become more and more like friends. The father is always still the father and the mother will always still be the mother. But the relationship is very different than when the son or daughter was six years old. The relationship matures. The same should be true with our heavenly father. Please turn with me to James 2. James chapter 2. The Apostle James describes a patriarch who had a very mature relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we read this in James chapter 2 
and in verse 23. James chapter 2 and verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. He was called the friend of God. Brethren, can we say that about us? Has our relationship with our Heavenly Father reached a level to where we could be called a friend of God Most High? So brethren, we determine, we determine our individual and personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. Brethren, in today's sermon, we have explored the subject of being led by God our Father in our personal daily lives. And we've explored that subject through four points, which are, point number one, our Heavenly Father does not push us. Just like pushing a chain, pushing does not ultimately work. It doesn't bring about the right result. However, Satan is the one who pushes Point number two, our Heavenly Father draws, leads, and guides us. You know, just like pulling a chain, God our Father draws us to Him and leads us toward His kingdom. But we have the duty and the responsibility to follow Him. Point number three, as shepherds, God our Father and Jesus Christ lead us as their sheep. God our Father and Jesus Christ gently lead us from the front like a shepherd guiding his sheep. They do not drive us like cattle from behind by scaring us and moving us against our will. And point number four, you determine your relationship with your Heavenly Father. We must work out our own salvation on a personal and individual level and basis. We must be busy deepening our relationship with God our Father each and every day. Deepening that relationship must be the priority in our lives. Nothing is more important than that. Brethren, I end this sermon with a personal question that only you can answer. And the question is, as demonstrated by your deeds and actions by your words and speech, by your private inner thoughts, by your attitudes, by your love of others, and by your love for your Most High God, are you being led by our Heavenly Father?